Okay, <clears throat> we are in 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Solomon dedicates the elaborate new temple in Jerusalem. We good, David, on the sound? Yes. Okay, let's pray. Lord, as we come to this really neat part of the scriptures where Israel is now in there <coughs> in Jerusalem and the temple is being built, it's finished, Solomon's now dedicated. So help us just to understand what's here and how we can apply any of the stuff here to our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Solomon assembled at Jerusalem the leaders of the tribes of Israel <coughs> and whoever of the citizens could attend from the north to the south, all throughout the land, <clears throat> that they might <clears throat> assist him in dedicating the house of God. And in this eighth chapter, the word house is used no less than 25 times. And, <clears throat> and then if you look at the companion passage of this in, in 2 Chronicles chapters 5, 6, and 7, it's the word house is used no less than 35 times. Because you see the structure <coughs> was indeed the house of God. So notice verses 1 and 2 of 1 Kings chapter 8. Now Solomon assembled the elder of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, of the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Now, What made <clears throat> this uh, costly building the house of the Lord, we might add, or ask? Not simply that God commanded it to be built, which he did, and chose Solomon to build it, which he did, or that he gave the plans to David and provided the wealth to construct it, which he did. did. Those matters were very important, but the thing that made this temple the house of the Lord was the presence of the Lord God Jehovah in the sanctuary. And <clears throat> that presence of God in the sanctuary was represented by what? The Ark of the Covenant. Or the Ark of God's presence. So the ark was brought in to the temple. Notice verses 3 and 4 of chapter 8. So all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Now, since the temple was completed in the eighth month of one year and not officially dedicated until the seventh month of the next year, it was empty and unused for that 11 months, probably so that the, I mean, a couple very practical uh, things here, so that the dedication could, could coincide 
with the Feast of the Tabernacles, which we'll talk about a little bit later here. And so that the dedication could not only uh, coincide with the Feast of Tabernacle, but no doubt during this interim, I mean, you got a, you got a brand new house. And so you, you're putting the finishing touches were put on the new facility and detailed preparations made for the elaborate dedication ceremony that they're going to have. Now, in the Holy of Holies was enthroned between the cherubim that was signified, I mean the ark of the presence signified God's presence or Jehovah's presence. So he was in, enthroned between the cherubim. Now the pagan nations had their temples, they had their altars, they had their priests, they had their sacrifices, but their temples were empty and their sacrifices were useless in a, in a figurative sense. Didn't make, make any difference how much stuff they had in those temples or how many sacrifices they offered. It was all empty. I mean, it just was useless. And the true and living God dwelt in the temple on Mount Moriah in the presence of the ark. And so that's why Solomon's first act of dedication was to have the ark of the covenant brought from the tent that David had pitched for it and placed into the inner sanctuary of the temple. <clears throat> Any questions or comments so far? We good? Now, the equipment and furnishings that were in the tabernacle in the wilderness were brought to the temple and were probably stored there. Kind of like a maybe museum pieces because you see the, the stuff in the the furniture and everything in the in the temple was not only uh, elaborate or more elaborate, but was bigger. And so they they brought that in, and probably the the tent itself, the tent structure itself, was probably folded up, stored away in a in a nice safe place by way of remembrance. Yeah. I didn't hear. The furnishings of the stations and the uh -huh. and all that. Didn't they use that in the wilderness when they had the confusion? Yeah. Gone, they took into the temple. Yeah, they took that into the temple. Took that into the temple. But see that stuff like we mentioned last week when we were going over the furnishings and everything was quite a bit bigger. And was was all recon or brand new. It wasn't reconstruction, it was just made from scratch. And uh and so they had that other stuff and brought it in and, and, uh, and stored it. And who knows, it may have been used from time to time in smaller areas of, of worship. Okay, but the thing that the, the most important, just like in the, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, the most important piece of, the, the most important item was the Ark of the Covenant because that signified God's presence among his people. Carol. Pardon? Yeah, that was even made new. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't made new. That was, well, I don't think it was. I'll check on that. Um, I don't think it was. Pastor, where are you? Um, the priests place the ark before the large cherubim, and here's the interesting thing, that Hiram had made, whose wings span the width of the Holy of Holies, and the cherubim on the, the original golden mercy seat looked at each other, while the new cherubim looked out toward the holy place where the priests ministered. And a little bit different arrangement there because 
you have a situation here where you're going to have this temple, a permanent structure, was going to probably be used more. And so the, the cherubim just uh, representing the righteousness of God looked out towards the people so the people could understand how holy and uh, sacred this place was. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 8. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. Now, let me bounce back up to verse 5, because I, I don't want to skip over this because it's pretty important. Also, King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for mul because of their, their multitude. And so the dedication of the temple, like I mentioned earlier, coincided with Israel's Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, B-O-O-T-H-S. Now, hold your finger on... Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, and turn back to Leviticus chapter 23. In chapter 23, you have <clears throat> the feasts mentioned, the, the, the uh, unleavened bread, Passover and unleavened bread, feast of first fruits, feast of weeks, Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and then you come to the Feast of Tabernacles in chapter uh, 23, verse, beginning of verse 33. Now let me, let me read several verses. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. And so... This particular time, remember, it just said that they gathered together there in the seventh month. So this would coincide with this Feast of the Tabernacles. And on the first day, day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. <clears throat> so this is basically what they're doing at this particular time, when they gather there and they offer the, the they make offerings and, and sacrifices. And these are the feasts, verse 37, these are the feasts of the Lord, what you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. And now let's drop down to verse 39. Also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And this is, this is the instructions. I'm reading this primarily by by way of background and, and so you can understand about this Feast of Tabernacles and the, and the coincidence centered around that, the coinciding. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. That's what they would do in the wilderness. And then they'd take this stuff that they got, the leaves and the willows and everything, and they would make booths, B-O-O-T-H-S. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year, 
It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israels, Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations, and here's the purpose, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And then the summary statement. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> so annually, and this is still done, by the way. This is still done by a lot of the Orthodox Jewish people around the world. That on this particular month, they make these temporary tent-type structures and dwell in them to commemorate and to remember what took place in the wilderness. What took place in the wilderness. And it's not a, this stuff is not a myth. Just a minute. This stuff is not a myth. I remember Nancy and I, a few years ago, just down the street here, went to a, a Jewish Seder. But it's nothing like the Seder that we do. If you've ever, how many of you ever been to one that's conducted by the Jews? And the Rabbi Naomi Steinberg, whenever she would read from this script that they had, she said, and our mythical prophet Moses said, mythical. Mythical. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's uh, not a. It, what's what's amazing? It's not a real thing yet. It's not a real thing to them. Let me get Nancy and then Carol. Yeah, I just want to mention that there's a sect of Christianity that still observes these feasts and celebrations. Yeah. And we have friends over in the Gold Country whose neighbors are part of that, and they actually put up tents in their backyard and camp out during the Feast of Tabernacles when the Jewish nation is celebrating it. They do it too, and they, they believe that all Christians should be doing this because it's all part of the law. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say to that one. <laughs> I mean, if you just take it. <clears throat> if you take it literally, yeah. yeah. Um, but then also in the New Testament, it tells us not to, not to judge others by their celebrations of feasts and um, Sabbaths and new moons, etc. Keep in mind that the, by and large, the Jewish people are blinded. Now. They don't, they don't believe the Messiah has come yet. We do. And there's, there's a lot to be said for doing different memorials within the Christian community. What I mean by that is, here these Jewish folks, they do this, and a lot of them still do this, like Nancy just mentioned. A lot of them still do this at that particular time to remember what their plight was when they came out of Egypt and then were in the wilderness all those years. And here's an interesting thing. You, you take it as, we don't have to worry about that because we've been delivered. We've been delivered from bondage, much like they were delivered, but the one who delivered us from bondage, as far as giving his life, was Jesus. And we have two ordinances that we celebrate, you know, uh, the Lord's Supper and... Uh, and so is one of them, and so we, we celebrate that, looking back, because remember Paul, when he gave the instructions, 1 Corinthians 11 says that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Carol. This is backing up a little bit now, but talking about that Seder meal that you went to here, um, I've not been to it, but I've read about it, you know, here locally, and Kind of my guess is that s at least some portions of what you guys experienced, um, beginning with Rabbi Naomi, um, is that this was a Southern Humboldt 
Jewish congregation, yeah. Seder, as opposed to a traditional Orthodox Jewish right. Seder yeah. in the world today. Yeah. The, so I thought. There were several people there that we knew from the community and never knew they had any religious affici uh, affiliation. They just were there to be part of it. And it was, you know, we went to it thinking we would get in on a real Jewish one and understand how important it was to them. But it didn't turn out. And uh, the interesting thing is, remember when we had, we've had a couple of them here, and the, the usual, the ordinary Jewish Seder is conducted pretty much the same way that Pastor and Elva did it with us, except for the fulfillment stuff. See, and uh, they didn't, they, they did this, it was a kind of a ritual, became habit to them, but they didn't really understand what was going on. See, I remember um, years ago at the Assembly of God Church in Weot, some of you may remember Henry Katz. Henry Katz was their pastor for several years there, and he was an Orthodox Jew. Born a Jew, raised in a Jewish family, came to know Christ, and I just loved it. He 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 did a, a presentation one time right around the Easter season, and he came out in the whole uh, high high priest garb and everything. And it was and of course he a pretty good sized man, so he was very uh, impending, or, or, huh? Yeah, and commanding, and he just. It was it was glorious. Did it on a Friday night, and uh, it was something something to see. But uh, they still in the Jewish community, they still do it, but they don't know the meaning because they're blinded in part. There's a lot of Jewish folks who have come to know Christ, but uh, there's a lot of them by and large. I mean, there's a remnant. The Bible talks about a remnant, but that's about all there is, just a remnant. And this was done. When they came here on this particular day, the dedication of the temple, and offered the sacrifices and gave their offerings, this was done to remind the Israelites of God's provision in the wilderness while living in temporary tents and worshiping in a movable structure. However, now at this time, they were in their own city, Jerusalem, and would now have a temple in which to worship. And thus the sacrifice and to help express their gratitude for God's provision. Now, notice the last part of verse 7. Pardon? First Kings. Last part of verse 7 and then verse 8 here in First Kings chapter 8. It says, uh, all of verse 7, For the cherubim, sp cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. Now, what were the purpose of the poles? There were ringlets, not only in the tabernacle or in the, the um, ark of the covenant and, and the other furniture. What were the poles for? What's the answer? What's the answer? Because no one was allowed to directly touch. No one was allowed to touch it. What was the penalty for touching it? Death. 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 And uh, so they put the poles in. You could see the poles, but you know they, they, they. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. So that were they were inside and contained. And the when they took down 
when they took down that, that tent of meeting, they, they would start and everything was folded down like the veil was over the Ark of the Covenant so they couldn't look on it. And then they could, uh, the poles were put in it and then they could carry it with the poles. So the poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the in, inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And so just as God had prescribed, the priest carried the ark using long poles that passed through rings on its side. Okay? Verse 9. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Now, one of the controversies centered around this particular verse has to do with what's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 9 right around verse 4 where it says, where it talks about the earthly sanctuary and it talks about, it says, and in this sanctuary was the ark. And under the mercy seat, there was what? There was Aaron's rod that budded, the tablets of stone, and what else? And the pot of manna. Okay. At this time, for some reason, and I'm going to share that, what I, what I feel, and I'm in, in a good camp with a lot of folks. The pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded were no longer in the ark. Okay? At one time, those were in the ark. The pot of manna and the staff of Aaron, and then both of which were reminders of rebellion. Okay? But the nation, nation of Israel, at this time now, was now making a new beginning. And God did not want to concentrate, I don't think, on the rebellion necessarily. And so those items weren't needed. The important thing was that Israel obey the law of God that was kept in the ark. Make sense? It, yes, it makes sense, yeah. but I'm not, yeah, but <laughs> I, I'm not totally sure I agree. And what I'm trying to, because th- I know that I don't, um, Ruthie gave me one, but I don't have it memorized, the chronology of the books uh-huh. in, um, in the Old Testament particularly. And, but it seems to me as you go further into the Old Testament, there was still plenty of times that the Jews were rebellious where those reminders, if that's what yeah. was their purpose, yeah. would still be applicable. <coughs> that's my opinion. You're right, it could. It is. <laughs> and they probably, from time to time, the prophets reminded them of their rebellion that took place in the wilderness. You know, as, as they would rebel after this time, would remind them that. But the, the main thing I think that God is wanting to emphasize here and why just the tablets of stone were there, that the most important thing with this new beginning now, do away with the rebellion and concentrate on obeying what's contained in the law. I'm sorry, my curiosity just makes me have to ask this question. Who would have the authority to say, because even their high priests kind of rotated, right? Uh-huh. Who would have the authority to say, we don't need these parts anymore, we're removing them? Well, the, just the instructions from God. I just ponder because I think that's such a significant thing. Why was it not mentioned that God told them to take that out of there? It just, it puzzles me. That's yeah, it, yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, he's sometimes like I he's said, all no, about the no real reason, no real reason is given. No real reason is given other than any, any speculation. And I came across that thing that I shared about the rebellion and, and God, you know, those weren't any, you know, God didn't want to hang those around for, for, as a reminder of them. So. For some reason, 
and I don't, and I don't know where I got this at. I didn't think anyone was allowed to look in the ark once God they sealed weren't. those things yeah, in there. Weren't. So that's what gets my curiosity. Yeah. Like Carol gets my curiosity going. When did those things come out? Who had the who yeah. had the authority? I mean, yeah. obviously God does, but yeah. I just I'm surprised that anybody would even be brave enough to open yeah. it and take those things out. Yeah, yeah. I'll do some more research on that. Yeah, yeah. So now, once Solomon and the people had honored God, had placed his throne in the Holy of Holies in the temple, the glory of the Lord, represented by the cloud, filled the temple. Notice verse, verses 10 and 11. And it came to pass, when the priest came out of the holy place. Now it doesn't t say how long uh, a period this was, but probably took a long time because the offerings and the sacrifices were given and, and, it, and it set up there that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't number everything, everybody that showed up. So it came to pass after that when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Hmm. Pardon? Oh, I know. I was thinking about that uh, this week as I went over some of this stuff. That just this cloud that just hovered over there filled the temple to the point where the priests could not even see what to do. See? That's the, the result. That's the result of people honoring God and presenting themselves holy to the Lord is his, his glory just fills the place. See? What? Yep. See? That's what I want to see. I don't necessarily want to see a large, huge congregation. It'd be nifty if we could have every seat full and then some in this place. But whether we have as many as we have here today or the place full, what I, wanna, what I want to feel is the presence of the Lord. Okay? Or we, we sing that song, I can feel the presence of the Lord is in this place. Mm. That's what I want. Mm. So then Solomon spoke because there was limited space. I think Solomon speaks to those in close proximity to the ark. And here's what he says. Verses 12 and 13. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house. Solomon is saying this to the Lord. And a place for you to dwell in forever. And then he turns around. It says he turns around and delivers a short speech to the people. Verses 14 down through 21. Then the king turned around. And he blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, so he probably having to talk pretty loud. That's the day before PA system probably. And he said, blessed, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who spoke with his hand or spoke with his mouth to my father David and with his hand has fulfilled it saying, since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. God always chooses an individual before he chooses a place. He chooses an individual to minister and then sends him to a place. That's what I mean. See, 
You understand that? Before there was a building here, this was just a piece of ground. And God put it in the hearts of some people. Probably started out with one person and said, okay, I want a place where people can come and worship. So he, he had, a, had a place. He says, I, I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, Whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. See, some have really harassed David and harangued on him because they, they feel he was going out of line because he wanted to build a house for the Lord. But here it says, But the Lord said to my father David, Where it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build a temple, but your son, who will come from your own body, he shall build the temple for my name. So the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, and I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and I have built a temple for the name of the Lord, God of Israel. And there I have made a place for the ark. And which is the covenant of the Lord, which he made, when he's talking about the covenant of the Lord, he's talking about the Ten Commandments, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. We'll stop there. Next week, we'll look at Solomon's prayer of dedication, and we'll, you know, there's some excellent examples and guidelines on, on how to pray, and we'll be looking at some of those things next week. What I think I want to take away from this today is that part where when the people came, made offerings and sacrifices, the priests were doing their job the way they needed to do it. Mm. Stuff was in place the way it had been commanded. Then the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And when we do the stuff that's proper before the Lord, his glory honors it. He honors it and gives us glory, whether it's individually or collectively. Understand? Tough stuff. Yeah, Carol. <laughs> so when I think of God coming and filling the temple with the cloud, I always think of that being a white cloud, if you will, like super dense fog. Yeah. Um, and we have a physical phenomenon that happens at our house because of where we live right at the top of the river canyon, and I can, I can just picture it, you know. Huh. But there was saying it was a dark cloud. Dark cloud says and the same which thing. Which are like storm clouds. I just, yeah. you know, the light and dark and how that's always, I just find that surprising. I think it was a way of, Of God hiding His presence, hiding, displaying His presence with the cloud, but yet hiding Himself. Because we can't, so the people couldn't see. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and because it says uh, the priest, the priest came out out of there because. They couldn't continue ministering because of the cloud. They couldn't see what they're doing. See? Couldn't see what they're doing. See? And a lot of times, we want to see what we're doing. See? We want to, we want to see something visible. We are people who need to see stuff visibly. And if we have our sight. And we just want to see some stuff. But a lot of times, God just likes to work behind the scenes. And then all of a sudden, you know, we, we feel, rather than seeing his presence, we need to feel his presence. We need to feel his presence. And trust his presence. What, pardon? We need to trust his and trust his presence. Trust his presence. Okay. So that's that. This morning and the 11 o'clock 
time slot. I'm going to be talking about Abraham's failure of faith. Abraham's failure of faith. Okay, so stay tuned and we'll get to that in a little bit. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson. Help us to be instructed on what we need to do so that your glory takes over in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.